have a quorum. Item 3 or items for review and discussion. Item 3A or appearances. A, item 3A1 is a request to park a concession trailer behind the house on lodge number 35 building. Mr. Housen, are you here please? Thank you, Mayor. Yes, sir. Uh, Council. Uh, my name is Jerry Halpin. Can you give us your name and address, please? Yes. Jerry Halpin, 1509 Windsor Road, here in Perry. Okay. Thank you, sir. Uh, I'm a member of House and Lodge at 1017 Jernigan Street. We've been in this community for 175 years. I'm looking pretty good for that. <laughs> um, the reason we're here this evening is basically to ask permission to park our trailer behind our lodge building. We own 50 feet behind that building, which includes the apron all the way up to just a little past the telephone, the power pole in that parking lot. Uh, there are some other properties in town that do have trailers parked there. I've provided most of you uh, pictures of those trailers. Um, they've been there for quite a while. So we're just requesting that we have permission to park our trailer on our property. Uh, it would not block any, um, any access or parking in that parking lot. And also, uh, this first picture you see, uh, uh, the second one, I have a little outline of probably where our, approximately where our trailer would be parked. There's a little loading dock there. Excuse me? 
Where is the trailer park now? It's at a member's house and it's becoming a problem. It's, uh, better half is explaining that she doesn't really like it in the, in the yard. <laughs> I was wondering, has the um, has the lodge looked into potential places to park at storage facilities where sometimes these types of vehicles are parked, like with boats and other things like that? We are a nonprofit organization. And right. The food truck. Every dollar that we make in proceeds from that food truck goes to local charities. Right. And but I know you have operational expenses. And yes. That would certainly could certainly prove to be one of them. Um, what about the neighbors in that parking lot square? Have you discussed it with them? No, because this is our property. Right. And we are, you know, we, we want to be good neighbors. That's why, we... hey boss, this is Brandon Miller, uh, the head of our organization at the time. Um, we haven't talked to the neighbors about it because this is our property and we wanted to, to park it on our property but we also want to continue to be good neighbors. And as far as I know, there would be no problem. But you haven't spoken. No, we haven't spoken to anyone. Okay. Other questions, Council? Oh, Mr. Council is here. Okay. The other gentleman? Brandon Miller. Brandon Miller. Brandon Miller. And could you give us your address, please? My address. My home address? Yes. So we have it for the record. Yeah, sure. It is. 810. John E. Sullivan Road, by your Okay, thank you. Yes, sir. No other questions? We'll be back in touch with you and let you know when it will be on the regular council agenda. Thank you very much. Thank you. Appreciate you bringing us forward. Item 3A2 is the gradient redevelopment options. Mr. Patel? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. If you'll come and Please give us your name and address and let, let us know what you would like to do your discussion. Respected council members, uh, my name is Mark, uh, Mark Maguana, and address for the record is uh, 400 Gallery Parkway. Suite 1140 Atlanta, Georgia. Yes, sir. We are here to seek council's uh, uh, opinion on the option of the redevelopment of the properties located at 1004 St. Patrick's Drive and 200 Valley Drive. So, So we recently, uh, in the, we recently went through a full application of rezoning uh, the planning commission and everything and maybe our approach was incorrect. So we were advised that we should bring our options to council and seek out your opinion. You know, so I would like to present, we only have two options for two properties as a developer what we see. I would like to just take a couple of minutes and explain both options. So for the first, Option A, what we originally want to do, we want to develop both properties. These are old hotels that's been staying there for many years. They are concrete, solid structure, uh, very hard to demolish, uh, very expensive stuff. We would like to convert them into modern loft, rent only apartments with fully furnished and full amenities. So these would not be sellable units. You cannot sell them individually. These would be rent only. And there are lots of benefits of having those at particular location, especially for city as well as for us. So the 202 uh, room head in Valley Drive property, we would like to do 162 rentable units. Uh, the restaurant and bar would be renovated as restaurant and bar, and the recreational place uh, spaces for tenants. Uh, there will also be outdoor recreational areas. The St. Patrick Drive building, since it's so close to Walmart and all the nice retail places, uh, we would like to propose a brand new one-story retail shopping center. And the three building that is on the back side, uh, out of those 126 rooms, we would convert them into 108 modern lofts, rent only apartments. So, 
the billboard, what will happen to the billboard. Uh, we will remove all three or four pylon signs. We would just need one pylon sign for the shopping center, and we would request one, one monument sign for the apartment. Billboard, if we are allowed to keep, as long as we are older and the next owner for 24 months, we can rent it to the city of Perry for $1 one month. Or we can remove the billboard like our previous proposal. Uh, what are we asking for? Currently, both properties combined, we have over 300, close to 340 rooms. And we are already zoned for about 221 or some part, maybe 20 acres per, you know, 20 pounds per acre. We would like to increase it just around 15 to 20 percent and bring it to 262. The, uh, 270, 162 on the wedding drive and 108. So density variance is the only thing we are seeking. We need the frontage, setbacks, current zoning, we need everything else. We are not asking for any other financial assistance or tax benefits or anything like that. So, if you see the two properties in the blue color, maybe this screen is better. The two properties is in the blue color is the property the top right property is the one right next to the Walmart, and the bottom left property is the in front of that trailer park. That's just for the location. This is the wedding drive property. As you can see, we have close to 320 parking spaces. We would add gym, swimming pool will be renovated, you know, we'll have outdoor recreational areas. Out of 212 rooms, we'll end up having 162 dwellings. We'll of course add sprinklers, fire alarm, latest Wi-Fi system, and everything to make it appealing to corporate America type uh, dwellings. This is the same vector type property. As you can see, everything that is in yellow is the retail. So that orange section is where we would like to put that shopping center. So as you can see, going back close to 75, the continuous development of retail can stay and the three buildings in the back would stay as a multifamily uh, rent only dwellings. They would not be selling houses or sellable units. They would be rent only apartments. Uh, that would make to the public eye visually accessible to road. The retail will stay retail and those three buildings in the back would stay as multifamily. This is just to show that we will need, when we design, we will have ample parking and we would have all the fire truck turn around and emergency vehicle building approach and everything. We can meet all that. This is just to survey. We have land in the back. We can add ample parking as needed for the shopping center as well as for the apartment. This is just to show that we would, to have the shopping center in the front where the orange is and the blue where the apartments will go, we will need about 208 parking spots and the capacity of the property currently is up to 256 parking spots. So all the details aside, this is what your dwelling would look like. This is one example of the studio dwelling. This is the other example of the one bedroom, one living room, kitchen, rent only dwelling. This is what the conceptual design of our shopping center would look like, up front. So I know this is just a conceptual design and it is possible that council might consider that somebody might promise nice things and not do the nice things. So on that note, we would commit, we would commit to the structures that make it nice. We wouldn't make a monotonous brick building or a stucco building that is all uniform and boring like 1980s, 1990s. We would give it different storefronts, glass, stucco, hardy bank. We wouldn't have a uniform ceiling, which is cheap. We would have, maybe the corners would be 16 feet, then there would be lower 14 feet, and the middle two would be another 20 feet higher. The elements that make it upscale and modern for the retail shopping center, we would come in to have those elements in writing in our plan. For the apartment units in the back, rentable units, we would have stainless steel appliances, quad stove or granite stone tops. Uh, we would have cabinets actual plywood cabinets, not those particle board that just, you know, goes bad in five years. We have 15-inch TVs, brand new mattresses. So this would be fully furnished apartments. So what are the main benefits and why are we doing this? Why would somebody want to stay behind Burger King, as someone might think? Or why might somebody want to stay so close to the Walmart? 
See, this is a mixed-use benefit. I have lived in Ohio, Chicago, and Atlanta, and currently where we are developing, we have seen that for any city where there is a lot of retail congestion, amalgamation of retail as well as mixed use, that means some rentable unit brings benefit, complementary benefits to both. It takes away from the traffic on the road because currently a hotel hotel requiring 170 car on a peak summer, somebody staying in their apartments, they would not all of them would not have cars because they would elect to stay there like that. Additional benefit is these are corporate America lot. Everywhere we see, just like we did our feasibility study putting this one project here in City of Ferry, if Amazon Fulfillment Center is doing their study, if CarMax is doing their study, if FedEx is doing their study, they would realize that okay, Perry is far from Macon and far from Jacksonville, it's a good location. So next five years, Perry should have you know, a good distribution center. That's a lot of jobs and a lot of investment, you know, a lot of good things for city. But when these people come in, Amazon, FedEx, CalMex, or any big employer, Fortune 500, Fortune 1000 companies, they would like to see that, oh my God, my construction is going to be 12 to 18 months, and my training of employees and assembly line is going to be 15 months, 6 months. During that 2 to 3 years, can I spend that much money staying in my home with my good people in hotels and motels? So our studio apartments kind of fit perfectly in corporate America lifestyle because they are fully furnished. They already have swimming pool, gym, everything's renovated, brand new lock system, brand new fast 100 Mbps fiber Wi-Fi line. So these are very attractive to Amazon. Even for city, when somebody comes and approaches the economic development department or planning and commission to the council itself, it's a very, very good point for city to have and say, hey, we have hotels, we have upscale hotels, we have hotels, and we have the model of apartments where the lease is six months minimum. So you don't, if we don't rent this like apartment, we don't rent this like hotels. That is one of the big things. The other big, other benefits that you can have, giving us a little bit more density so we can afford the shopping center and have this is, it goes hand in hand with Houston County Joint Comprehensive Plan. It's not a very big point, city is fairly, is its own city. You know, you can show that, hey, you know, comprehensive plan came out in February that you should have a variety of, uh, you know, housing and ability for people to stay and then we approved it right away same year, we have something where people can stay. Another benefit our study brought out was Robin's Airbase is so close. Veterans make really good people that help out cities. You have veterans staying in apartments or their spouses who rent like that, even 10 or 20 percent of these units because it's usually just husband and wife. Uh, they can stay there. They make really good contractors, home people, and city of Penny has, let's say, some light problems. So if somebody wants to renovate their house, having more young people in town is always helpful like that. And the way city of Penny is developing very nicely, if you have larger houses, you can always show that, look, trying to attract educated young high income earners in our city. But let's say first year or second year they do not have enough money to put down payment for the big houses because houses are always not for 1200, 1500 square feet. But these are good stepping stones for one year, six months, 18 months to rent. They can get a feel of the city, they like everything, like okay I like the house, my house was under construction and now house is done, my lease is over six months, I can move. This is all we can do, and all we need is about 20-25% density values. We need everything else, parking, front edge. Should this not be an option we are allowed to do because we are not, we, we just try to understand what is the council's opinion and how can we do that, then this is our option B. The 202 room valid drive project that is currently approved as 120 dwelling multifamily it's already approved for 120. So we would like to do 50 low income section in housing and the other 70 would be regular dwelling. And combine both properties, we have realized because of the inner parking, we can have up to 90 truck parking. So we can make a great trucker's lounge. Between both properties, we have a restaurant bar because of the trailer park being right behind. The trucking community loves that in just one area, you have Walmart and all of those restaurants and shopping centers. And we wouldn't have to spend money on the shopping center, we would just make all the apartments. So Valley Drive project would stay as apartment as is, 
and the same metric null property would turn into extended stay motel. See, this benefits city in a way that when truckers come in, they tell their friends and more truckers come in, it just brings more business. If a lot more people are staying there, it brings a lot of business to the surrounding retail centers and restaurants. You know, about 90 truck is one of the larger, you know, it's not a small size, one hotel can accommodate between two properties. We advertise right, we already have existing billboard. So, you know, it ends up being a nice project. We can fill up. So the billboard would say truckers lounge Perry, we would do around 199 a week. We can provide uh, hotel rooms uh, in the restaurant, lounge and other open spaces. We would have free showers. So if some truckers are members of our hotel, they stay frequently, they would get free shower benefit, free truck parking benefit. We put outdoor outlets, outdoor lights, outdoor Wi-Fi and stuff like that. But what would be the ask here? This is our current plan. We don't have high density approved. This is this is approved as is. I have 120 dwellings approved on Valley Drive, and my hotel is the hotel right now, hotel motel. Uh, I would really need help with police and fire department because trucking community is one of America's most hard, most hardest working community. But the work-related lifestyle brings certain nuisances. Sometimes it is drug abuse, sometimes it's prostitution, you know. We will obviously have security, we'll check their IDs, we'll have CDLA drivers, nice people and everything. It's not that every single trucking lounge and truck stop exit ends up being a bad exit, but some of them do. So I'm here up front that if I end up going with option B, sticking to my current plan, then I would request assistance because, you know, my security people might not be enough. If the truckers park at my lawn and go to Walmart and high density retail centers and other places, it does not work out because we can't differentiate between our customers and just regular citizens. So that would be option number B. This would be our billboard, uh, Perry Truckers Lounge and Hotel from the exit. And our current, I'm sorry, one more. Here we go. Uh, and our current, this is the current picture. We just changed the lounge. And our study shows because of the existing trailer park, so much retail being there, most of the truckers love, would love to park their trucks and just have a place to shower or rent rooms and stuff like that. So I'm here seeking counsel's opinion which option I should go for. You know, any thoughts, gentlemen? Mr. Wood, this is quite out of our process. Uh, this is something that we normally would do, would it not go through the planning and zoning uh, process? So he's speaking about two, part, two separate parcels. Um, one of them, the one on, on um, St. Patrick's Drive, has been through the process and came to council and uh, you denied their request. So for them to come back with a with a new proposal to use the, the motel for residential, um, that will require at least a special exception, and that will have to wait. That cannot be reconsidered for six months from the day that you denied this, and I believe that was last month. Um, on the Valley Drive um, property, that property did receive a special exception from council um, under a, a, a different developer. Um, the applicant here, or the uh, gentleman here, uh, do have the opportunity to uh, submit a new application um, at, a, at any time for that property and move through the process on that. But there is a six-month delay on the St. Patrick's Drive property because of the because of state law uh, requiring that um, you cannot reconsider or resell the application after after a denial. Should the application not come through planning and zoning? Yes, it would be submitted through planning and zoning and go through the process, um, the normal process. I think the uh, applicant is just, uh, I don't know, um, asking for council's opinion of the, of the different options that he's looking at. With, with all due respect, Mayor, sir, uh, the reason I was asked to seek council opinion because last time, 
We spent about 486 man hours from bank people, feasibility, accounting, electrical engineer, mechanical engineer, plumber, architect, myself, other owners, my project managers. 486 man hours. We spent about $48,600 doing everything. We went through planning and zoning commission hearing. We answered all of their questions. We had the citizen's advertisement. We talked to the surrounding people. We did everything we did in other five cities of Georgia State where we did the zoning. And our final vote with City of Council last week, uh, or the week before that, I apologize, uh, was denied. We could not provide you any reason, and we understand we really missed a step. We did not consider your guys' opinion, or maybe when we applied for PUD zoning, that advice was not correct. I, I don't know, I don't want to point fingers. I take the blame that I did not consider council opinion before. So I'm committed to this. My lender is changing all of their loans to extended stay hotels and trucks. Uh, we would still like to do apartments. But I, if I wait six months, I have all these signs up, and I, I can't change my plans in the middle. I would possibly like to get the Valley Drive project, special density exception request, filled out this month and come in front of you again next month. I will have all this data and more information again, sir. But at that point, I would be too late if I'm rejected. I would have put too many man hours and too much money. And even for that property, I would revert back to trucking. So I thought the advice given to me to come and seek council's guidance was a good advice. So it's, correct me if I'm wrong, Mr. Wood, but it's not our process to give advice before they go through and you guys look at it and give counsel. I think that's correct. Um, I believe the gentleman had a meeting with the city manager who advised them to come to uh, council. Um, yes, typically you are not giving advice beforehand. Um, and I think, the, uh, I, I don't know, I think they're looking for options of how to deal with these uh, St. Patrick's Drive properties. Mr. Warren, I did advise the applicants that they could come and talk to council because they were concerned and it was just stated about the fact that the PUD request was turned down. I also gave the applicants the reason, at least as I understood it, about why council turned it down because one, they were concerned about it coming in as a PUD that could possibly be subdivided off. And the second was that uh, council was not comfortable, at least my understanding, council was not comfortable by having apartments located at that location, which is right by Walmart, and where there's going to be more commercial retail sales and development with the extension of St. Patrick's Drive. Uh, as Mr. Wood has indicated, Whichever way the petitioner wish to go, they're going to have to, as I understand it, they're going to have to wait six months relative to the St. Patrick's Drive location. Whether council was for some of the concept, or council may be against, or more likely not having any follow-up recommendations at the planning commission, council probably doesn't have any opinion one way or the other right now because you have not seen the final. Going back to the mayor's point. You all have not seen the final request coming in to you. You've been presented two possible, as I understand it, two possible options. On the Valley Drive, Drive site, as uh, Mr. Wood has indicated, they're free to file tomorrow, you know, relative for the request about the increased density. But that will be a change relative to the special exception that council had granted to them, so we will have to go through the process of planning commission. Um, and that's the administration's position. And, and just for clarification, uh, the proposal for the trucker's lounge is something that would be permitted by right um, in that zoning district and would not require action.
my recollection when we um, granted the special exception before with the other owner who had come to us was that we were looking for an opportunity to provide workforce housing uh, and at an affordable rate. We were not looking at, it was not an application for a trucker's stay over and lounge. It was, uh, that's, it was a totally different project that was presented to us at that time that we got in to grant the special exception. Yes, and the, uh, the gentleman here, they're mixing, or I think they're confusing two different properties. So the trucker's lounge, as I understand, would, is a proposal for the St. Patrick's Drive property only. Is that the, not Valley Drive? So what, the, so what would end up happening in option A? We, we would get uh, both the properties, whether it's next month for one property and six months later for the other property. We would put both properties in nice full scale renovation and one shopping center. We would have to demolish the building or cut parts of it. Something nice. It would require more money, more time. But if I'm not granted, I'm locked in with the money and contract. My only option to make money is turn one property into motel and keep other property as low section housing, but both of them would be marketed and advertised towards trucking community because they do free marketing. If one trucker knows it, they like the location, they'll tell the other trucker, they'll tell the other trucker. They talk to each other on the radio all day long. Yeah, I understand that. It's just that I wanted you to understand that when we gave a special exemption before, it was for an entirely different uh, situation and uh, set of circumstances that never uh, corporate uh, law. I, I'm still trying to figure out law, uh, where a law comes in there. Uh, anyway, that's a small issue. But um, so to me, this is an entirely new uh, thing. I mean, do we about a trucker's lounge on St. Patrick's Drive? Yes, and that is something that they can do without without council approval. I mean, I love truckers. They bring my Amazon boxes. Yes. So there's no issue with that. On the, when we were talking about the Valley Drive property, um, I don't know that the applicant um, brought up anything about corporate um, apartments, but um, Ashley Harden, the community development um, or, or she, economic development person, um, Said that there, she saw uh, a lot of um, potential um, that you know um, some of the corporations already in the city, um, like ADS and um, uh, Graphic Packaging, they may want to have um, rent uh, a few of those for interns that come in or people that are coming from out of town uh, that need to be here for a week or so um, that are associated with the with their business already, but they have a, a place for them to stay that's not a hotel. So while the applicant wasn't really talking about corporate apartments, um, I think that we were thinking that there is an opportunity for that, whether it's a regular apartment uh, building or one of these uh, converted uh, buildings as an apartment. And I, as far as I'm concerned, that's really kind of the same thing. Um, you may just have a little more transient uh, population, but um, there's still apartments that you have folks uh, living in for some period of time. And if we do not, if we do not go with the new plan, we stick to the current plan and current approval. If 50 of those units would be categorized as Section 8 low income affordable housing. Yes, ma'am. Mayor, to your original question, sir, this might not be the, the process the city has approached before, but my previous application went through planning and zoning commission with all the answers, all the citizens, all the data, all the work, and I thought it was a good advice to seek out your opinion and understand the detail before I put more hours or more you know, work into the proposal. Having a shopping center at the front facing Walmart and the three buildings in the back as rented rent token units, you cannot subdivide and own them. They will never be. This is good for future business, for corporate, for low income, however you consider, but we do make them really nicely. 
when we sub when we submit our final proposal, everything I'm committing to stainless steel appliances, nice shopping center with all the conceptual design, we will actually do. But having having done five or six applications, when you do all the work and the day the day of the final vote, you get a thirty second consideration. And maybe it was my mistake when last time Mr. Wood said that planning commission recommends approval, but the city administration recommends denial. I had that 18 second window if I wanted to come up and speak, and I was just flabbergasted. I had no idea why after so many smart people say this is a good thing for city and for you, somebody denied it. And I lost that 18 second opportunity, and my vote was denied. And now I don't have six months. So I'm just here seeking your opinion. Should I continue on my track for the Trucker's Lounge? Or does Council feel I should submit an application and there is a good chance that Council sees it positively to give me approval for a little bit higher density? See, the previous applicant, like you said, ma'am, he had a very good deal. He backed out of that deal with the current owner because when he realized I'm only doing 120 apartment, and the cost has risen significantly over the last 12 months of everything. We are still committing with more money, better project. We are still, the city has advertised that something nice is coming, we're going to fulfill that advertisement. We're going to do a nice thing here. But I don't want, again, hundreds of men or hundreds of thousands of dollars and then 18 second consideration and then get a rejection. So I'm just humbly asking you guys' opinion, sir. And man. If I have one, uh, consider all we say, we come back to what Mr. Wu has said, that uh, the planning and the zoning commissioner has to approve what you are looking for. And that's one of the things that has to be done. And that's one of the processes that we have, we always had. It's not that you've got to bypass them and come straight to us. I know you understand that. It's sort of bottom line is that I understand that you want to put the rental houses on uh, on one street there, you know what I mean? Uh, old Fort Valley Highway, you know, because we got places, already got business down on that highway down there. And so we can understand that, but the proper procedure is that you said option B, you can already do that, but back to the same pattern, that's a different uh, uh, situation there, you know what I mean? So that's something that uh, has to be considered uh, well, we have to make a decision which way we're going to go. So I think uh, I know it's kind of hard for you because I know you're ready to go to work, but I think you got to have a little patience, you know what I mean? And I say in due process, I believe that the situation will work out for you if, if, if you've got the patience to wait. And, and we weigh every situation and we weigh every option that if you bring before us, and I believe it'll be a, a good take for the state of here. I absolutely appreciate your opinion, sir. I, 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 will, I will wait out six months if I have to, and I will follow the process, the due process. I started investing my time and company's money from Thanksgiving, December, all the preparation and my reward after the due process was in March. But I will do that all over again, sir. I will prove it. I'm a patient man. We will do the work. We are not turning away. We are not going to give promise and turn away. But on the note, I just had a thought. If we can, and I'm not even sure this is possible, if we can appeal the last decision and we vacate the conviction of the last decision, can we withdraw and then we would not have to wait six months for the same period? I think the council has already taken action, so withdrawal after the fact um, is not an option. It's not an option. Right. Okay. I understand, sir. Any other questions, Council? You will take, your, you know, take this under advisement. We appreciate the information. Thank you so much, sir. I really appreciate your time, Thank you. Thank you.
So we were really excited about this just because we were able to include so much more about a site than just looking at it from the street. And then on the churches tour, we really need help with this one. Um, we've, most of the churches, we weren't able to find a lot of history on them. And I even called some and I couldn't even get a good phone number. So we're still, we're, we're still working on the churches. But um, like if you click down on either the Perry Methodist or the Episcopal Church, uh, First Methodist or Episcopal, um, so we have the old photo there. And then I, 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 we were trying to find pictures of the insides of the church, so we, I found one on Facebook of the Methodist Church, and then we had any photos that we had, we included here. Their new, their new um, Family Life Center is on there. So, but there are some churches that are really old, and we just don't have any history on. I need to get in touch with the pastors of those churches. Um, but we're still working on that. So one thing that we love about this is that we can always add more photos, we can add more stops to the tour. We're even talking about make, making a bicentennial tour where we include things that are part of Perry's history, like the old Dairy, the Dairy Queen. There, we have so many old photos of that Dairy Queen, not, not, not her, but over the ages, the Dairy Queen that was out there on Courtney Hodges, even Skipper John's where they used to have that boat out there, things like that. We might include in like a bicentennial tour. We're still we're working with Ellie and talking about doing coming up with that. But um, I'm trying to look at my notes and see if I missed anything. I um, I guess we just wanted to present this to you and ask your thoughts. If you have any questions. Questions, council, comments? Looks really good. We will have to, I think one of the main things was we wanted it to be like stories of each place and not just this house was built in and this person lived there to make it more interesting for people that might not necessarily be really into history. Um, this just literally launched like two weeks ago on the website, but one of the next um, aspects that we'll have is when you're on your mobile phone, then it'll be like a speaking text as well. So when you're at the site, there'll be a button you can press that'll read you the text that's a, or the history that's about each site. So you're not like on your phone looking at the site and having to read it. So yeah, we're adding an audio component, and we're also um, adding where each stop or each tour with a printable PDF, so someone could just print the, the tour stops out if they wanted to, uh, more like a printed version. Um, um, may I give you some information? Yes, sir. New Old Baptist on um, W.F. Reagan Drive is the first black church. That's the old New Hope. I saw uh, where you had the new New Hope, which is on this street, but I did not see the old one on W.F. Reagan Drive, and that is the first black church in here. And our pastor is usually there two or three days a week that can give you information about that church. I think I left a message on their voicemail. And I think if you click on that, I think we might have the old church on that one. Um, is that the one you're speaking of? Mm-hmm. But that's, that's all we have. So um, I really want to get in touch with the pastors of all of these churches to see if there are any other photos. And I'd like to get pictures of the, the sanctuaries in the churches and um, get a little more text, like a little more history and stories to put in there. Um, also, every, every stop isn't necessarily historical. One of the homes that we included um, is it's not one of the oldest homes, but back in the day, um, they would put new cars in their garage because the, the owner owned a car, a car lot, 
and the people in town would go and peek in the garage doors to see what the new models look like. So we thought that was a great story, so we included that on the tour. But um, we tried to put a lot of stories in. We tried to um, and put as much history as we could get in there. And it's a work in progress. We're still we're con we plan to constantly be updating this and working on it. Thank you for all the hard work. We appreciate that. Well, I get a lot of issues. She's not here, but she's sort of a lot of credit. Well, thank, 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 thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Very good. Thank you. Housing characteristics, because that'll all be 
um, available through the census and the American Community Survey. So we'll really know the, the makeup of the folks that live in these areas. So thinking about that, I also have a copy for you of these proposed areas. And we will look at them individually as well, but you do have an overview map. So sort of starting on the western side, the first one will show is Heritage Oaks. This includes the airport of Heritage Oaks Park and Austin Springs, that general area. Um, just south of that is the preserve area, which includes the preserved agricultural village and um, the Holly Hills neighborhoods. Next, we have Alpine, which is uh, on the northern side and primarily includes the Alpine Valley neighborhood. Next is St. Patrick's, which includes the proposed extension of St. Patrick's Drive, as well as development around uh, Walmart and areas like that. Next is Sam Nunn, so that includes all the Sam Nunn development, uh, Kroger shopping area, Hampton Court, that general area, all the way up to uh, downtown. And then next we have Old Perry, which includes downtown and the Old Mill neighborhood. Next is Creekwood, which is pretty similar to the previous Creekwood. Includes the Creekwood Park and the neighborhood surrounding it. Next is Fairgrounds, so obviously that includes the Fairgrounds, and um, also the Sand Hill neighborhood and the um, industrial area off of Jernigan, which includes Interflow. Next is Tucker, so neighborhoods um, south of downtown in and around the Tucker area. Next is Satterfield, so including from Satterfield Road down to the wastewater treatment facility, Brindell subdivision, and um, over to Abbey Plan as well. Brochure, that includes Brochure Park, the hospital area, Morningside Drive, and the neighborhoods around uh, Morningside Elementary. Uh, Pine Needle, that, which includes Pine Needle Park and the neighborhoods surrounding it, and also Legacy Park, and uh, development on the southern side of Perry Parkway in that area. East Perry, this is primarily residential development off of King's Chapel Road and Burr Road. It also includes our uh, Davis Farm Fire Station. Next is Langston, that includes um, developments on the southern portion of Langston Road, <coughs> as well as the northern side of Perry Parkway in that area. Lake Joy, that is development on the north side of Langston Road. Uh, it includes Lake Forest Subdivision and um, Langston Road Elementary. Houston Lake, um, development near Houston Lake and also um, the Wooded Eagle Subdivision off of Santa Fe Road. State Route 127, this is, well it has about one parcel in it, but um, it, it includes properties on the north side of South, South State Route 127 and you know any potential annexations that way. Next is the Talton area. That includes the uh, development on the south side of State Route 127, the north side of Bear Branch, so the Grand Reserve subdivision and the new Planters Ridge subdivision. Uh, Mossy Creek. This includes the Mossy Meadow subdivision and the Mossy Creek Middle School on Danny Carpenter. And last is the Woodlands, which includes the Woodlands subdivision, uh, Santa Fe Place, and Wind River. So looking at these areas, wanted to gather your comments and feedback.
feedback on these proposed changes, answer any questions that you may have related to the strategic planning areas. I have a question. Yes, ma'am. Uh, five, five foot area, what was that in the area of there by Sam Dunn, off Sam Dunn? Yes, ma'am. Five points is in the Sam Dunn area. Okay, and we hope we've been what area? Uh, New Hope is also in Sam Dunn. I'll click back to that one so we can see it a little better. This one is pretty big. It goes all the way from the interstate all the way into downtown. Um, 
with extra bedrooms or office space uh, to do that, uh, that remote work. Um, we will see um, an increase in the number of permits for additions to existing homes um, or for accessory structures uh, to accommodate those office spaces. Um, and we may even see people wanting to make some modifications like adding pools or whatever uh, to accommodate the new lifestyle of the home more often. Um, we think that there's a potential for an increase in code compliance cases. Uh, where people are staying at home uh, during the day and noticing things about the neighborhood that they may not have noticed um, during the evening. And so that could potentially increase the code compliance um, issues and um, possibly um, an increase in the number of home occupations and residential business permits for those folks that are starting their own business as opposed to working, for, uh, working from home for a business that's located somewhere else. Um, so I think it's we've already been, been seeing some of this and I think we'll continue to see this but these are the major impacts uh, that I think the community development department would have. I'd be happy to answer any questions you may have on this one. Great. Mr. Wood, how do you see this evolving in terms of the type of housing requests that we're gonna, gonna see? Like what impact do you see of staying at stay home? Potentially larger homes. Um, uh, I think people are going to get on each other's nerves. Um, you know, if they're at home a lot. So I think having a dedicated office space, um, and you know, that may grow into um, homeschooling where the kids are at home. Um, and so you want to have some places where you want to separate from one another um, during different times of the day, at least. So I think it's potentially larger homes than what we may have seen in the past, um, or potentially larger lots. Um, but again, that is going to relate to the affordability issue and, and what people can afford. Um, but I think you know those are, are two areas where um, we may see that impact. Or if it's not a larger lot, a neighborhood that has a pocket park or some, uh, or is close to a um, park area or open space where they can get out and, and kind of um, be to themselves or whatever uh, from all of the activities that are, that are occurring here in the home. Other questions? Thank you, Mr. Woodward. Thank you. 3C1B is fire and emergency services. Chief Parker himself. <laughs> himself. Thank you, Mayor, Mayor Council. Uh, so, as a uh, current college student, one of the things I did when uh, manager sent this out was I went straight to Google to uh, search and see what kind of research there was out there. So, I'll, I'll show you. A little bit about the research, talk about some current uh, statistics and trends we have going on in the fire department now, and then what I feel like the impact's going to be going forward. So basically, as far as internet research, uh, not a lot out there when you look at fire department specific research, but there was one article that I found that uh, reported that during the stay at home period of early 2020, uh, you know, when we first hit COVID and everybody said stay at home, our um, EMS responses went down nationwide. Um, auto accidents were down, those kind of things. Uh, head injuries, limb injuries, cardiovascular issues, those kind of things went down. Okay, so we actually did experience a decrease as well during that same period. From about February to July of 2020, our responses were down. And I'll show you that on the slide here in, a, in just a second. However, when the initial stay-at-home orders were lifted and people began to get out, emergency responses increased and they have continued to increase since that time. So here, uh, I know it's hard to see, but you may have it there in the board pack, but you can see uh, the, the 2020 and 2021 medical and motor vehicle accidents. That's the cause. And you can see kind of the ups and downs there on what we responded to during that time. So uh, the highlighted area that I have circled in red, that is that February to July time frame when things were down a little bit. 
Um, but like I said, since that time has increased in 2020 and 21, those numbers have remained up since then. All right, now some further research that I found on the internet says that 26.7% of U.S. employees are already working at home in 21. So if that is the case for the parish service area, we may already be experiencing the effects of and that current trend is likely to continue. Like I said, our call volume has gone up, and if we do have the amount of people working at home, they say, is already there, then we're already experiencing that based on the research that I found. Now, some more research indicates that households with members who teleworked more frequently come from you know, higher levels of income, they have higher levels of education, and also better health. So with that, you know, we would expect or anticipate that the number of EMS responses should stay near the same or maybe go down just a little bit, but we haven't experienced that yet. Here's some basic uh, statistics on where we are right now. You can see from uh, 2018 to 2019, it was an 18.5% increase in responses. However, that did fall in 2020, and we think some of that could have been for that initial uh, decrease during February to July. We, we dropped about 6.5%. But then in, from 20 to 21, we've gone up 23% of our responses. Okay, so 23% more responses in 21. Now in 22, we have already, in just through February, we have increased another 15%. Okay, uh, so again, uh, I have the numbers there. So we anticipate if things continue, we'll, we'll reach a record of about 3,000 emergency responses this year if we continue like we have been uh, the last couple of months. Now, what does that mean? Well, if, those, uh, if that trend continues, uh, how's that going to affect us? Well, basically, you can see we'll have a, an interruption uh, in our non-emergency duties. So that means when the guys are going out trying to work on or check the fire hydrants, or maybe they're out doing training, all these kind of things, they're going to get interrupted by additional emergency responses. They'll have to take time away from that to run the calls and then get back to it. So the time's going to be, you know, have to be a little more flexible. Uh, so whether it's flow testing, public education, all those kind of things are going to result in delays or reschedules. Uh, interruption opportunities for uninterrupted shift training. Uh, obviously, if we run more calls, we're going to have more wear and tear on uh, apparatus, things like tires, batteries, uh, other maintenance. Uh, obviously, fuel consumption is a, is a, could be a big concern for us if, if this trend continues. Uh, and gas prices stay where they are. Uh, and also, may delay emergency responses to other calls because the unit's already tied up. We get another call coming in, it's going to be a delay until the next unit can get there. And then, of course, uh, we, we would see that as increase for mutual aid requests, relying on our partners in the county to help us with responses if, if needed. Okay, so the workforce uh, working from home impacts. Uh, talking over with staff, we suggest that if more of the workforce operates from home, research indicates we'll likely see more EMS calls for mental health. This is one of the studies that has shown that People stay at home more, they have less social interaction, and they suffer from depression, which may result in additional emergency responses to EMS problems. Uh, increase possibly in home cooking fires due to multitasking. Somebody gets putting some french fries on the stove, and next thing you know, they get a phone call from work and they have to go handle something. You know, now we've got distractions and we could have additional cooking fires. I put on here less traffic, but if you think about it, these people may uh, have, there may be less traffic during normal commute times, but if you stay home all day, you're eventually gonna feel like I've gotta get out somewhere. So the nights and weekends, we may have additional traffic that we have had in the past. And then, so finally, as, as far as a summary, uh, we feel again, the initial shutdown uh, did result in a decrease in emergency responses. Uh, emergency responses are currently 15% ahead of 2021, uh, so we're going to be busier. Uh, we'll have more wear and tear on our vehicles and fuel consumption. 
can increase mental health issues. Uh, some research indicates 45% of the population is already working from home, so that could uh, have more people at home lead to more fires or home accidents, less traffic during peak times, but maybe more on the weekends. And then, so we anticipate emergency responses to reach approximately 3,000 for this year. And I'll answer any questions if you have any questions. The solution to that would be what a new ladder truck is that? One point five million dollars. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well that cleared it up. Thank yeah. you. <laughs> Obviously, uh, you know, if you're running more responses, you know, additional personnel. Uh, if you're, you know, when trucks wear out, you need to replace them. You know, we do have a, a I think, a pretty good replacement plan. You know, if we stay with that, we should be okay. But um, as our trucks get older, they break down more, and, and those those breakdowns cost money. And you know, but I know new trucks cost money as well. So you know, I'm not I'm not asking for the moon uh, or anything like that. But just kind of report it. Thank you, Chief. Yes, Mayor. Appreciate your information. Uh huh. Three C one C is the Department of Public Works. Thank you. Um, some of this has already been touched on, so I'll just kind of go over it quickly. Um, the jobs that are eligible for remote working typically are not your essential frontline workers. These are people who have achieved higher levels of education, hold higher paying, white collar jobs, and either have previously or currently um, been employed in city centers or live within a commutable distance of that job. So with this trans, you know, transition into a remote work environment, um, with these eligible jobs, the people now can relocate to communities based on quality of life or amenities. Austin County and Perry have a lot of things that would draw people here, um, education system, lots of things. So I would anticipate that to contribute to residential development here. Uh, these types of positions can have flexible hours, and so you know, with that extra time and the higher levels of education, I would anticipate we would see a higher percentage of people who have the time to invest and participate in their community. Um, Public Works relies on a lot of contractors for different functions. Um, I've listed some of them here, tree contractors, obviously solid waste, residential trash pickup, um, HVAC, animal control, rescues, and so some of those contractors may end up transitioning their administrative, dispatch, sales, jobs to remote work. And we have noticed this um, starts to impact waste management on whether their calls are sent to a call center. So if um, our residents aren't sure to call Public Works and then call the call center, they will ask you what city you live in. So that's an impact to our residents. So I can see that um, continuing to increase and have potential impacts to our operations. Internally, um, I would just expect to have increased interaction and exposure for all of our service delivery functions. Uh, people are home to observe trash collection, routes, patterns, stormwater. Um, when they're typically away at work during the day, they can see how that impacts their property while they're home. Um, obviously, trash is going to be a big one too, um, and I have a slide to go over that in particular, but online shopping, um, you're home during the day, you're producing more residential trash, people have more time to do DIY and home projects, um, and then just in inherently customer service may get more calls about these um, city services. So for trash collection, data shows that um, residential trash is world, uh, not worldwide, but at least nationwide has increased 25% since um, the COVID down. So we're all animals on the market. Yes. <laughs> um, and that's right. E-commerce has really been boosted. Um, consumer spending 870 billion dollars in 2021. 
So our contractor waste management reported 6,700 tons of residential trash in Perry in 2020, and 6,800 and some change in 2021, which is more than 1,000 tons compared to 2019, and 2,200 tons more than in 2018. So trash is going to be continue to be a big impact working from home. And then the last thing I'll go over is just our utility infrastructure. Um, as I mentioned before, you know, Houston County of Perry is going to be a popular place for residential development. And people working from home will utilize and consume more of our water and sewer infrastructure. There's some data here. Um, since 2019, you can kind of see the million gallons per day. And wastewater was definitely affected or at least reflected that it was affected during 2020, which was the height of um, lockdowns across the nation. In addition to that, um, utility locates, you know, as development increases, we'll see a heightened need for utility locates. Um, and then those people working from home will put a higher demand on fiber utility. And I think we've already seen a lot of that impact to uh, collateral damages um, and locate requests in general from our utility department. So that will just continue to increase with residential development as well. That's all I have. If you have any questions. Question. Thank you very much. Appreciate the information. Item 3C1D. It's the Department of Legal Services. Right. One. Right. Thank you, Mayor and Council. I'll uh, read through this. Uh, I provided copies of the original impact assessment as well as this presentation. So uh, the original one was more detailed and kind of boring. So I'll let you read that in your leisure. No pun intended. I'll do it. <laughs> All, right. All right. So the impact assessment. Um, we, we analyzed it. We analyzed uh, projected trends, and one of the first areas that we focused on was the environment or our surrounding areas. Uh, of course, uh, being in such close proximity to the Air Force Base, we saw that um, we know that Roberts Air Force Base will be the tech hub for the Air Force, and with that designation as the tech hub, there'll be an increase in um, contractors and, and those uh, associated services. So, looking at the the data, we found that um, there should be a potential increase in information, admin support, and tech services. Uh, those are the stars that indicate on, on the graph. Um, so we currently, uh, these are the areas in middle Georgia that we have that make up 28% of the workforce currently. So that translates into we have a higher potential for growth, and, and, and I guess it, it, it um, explains why House Academy in this area has been growing population-wise. Uh, so there's some other projections and trends that I noticed, that I, that I noticed during my um, research. Uh, in terms of leisure services, people are more interested in work-life balance. Uh, they are no longer worried about going to the office, traffic, and all these other items. They would like to have a great balance day-to-day. Uh, -day. I provided some, some stats and some data found in articles, but uh, there will also be a 105 hours of uh, free time, increase of, a, of an average of 105 hours of free time. So because you're working from home, uh, studies show that people have a lot more free time and, and need to be entertained and need some leisure opportunities. Uh, the mental health aspect, uh, of course with the, with the pandemic and now you cooked up in the house working from home, there has been um, there was a study that showed that 37, I'm sorry, 73 of the workers uh, reported that they were burned out. So as a director of leisure services, what does that mean? We need to find some, something for them to do. Um, child care, that is a hurdle or an issue that many Americans are facing today. Uh, there's a lack of opportunity or places to take the kids. Many Americans are working from home while providing child care uh, to the kids. Uh, so we, we notice that as a trend and something that to mark on our strategic approach to this. Uh, then I found something interesting was a, a boomerang boomers and sandwich generations. Studies show that uh, there are more 
multi-generational families now. So grandparents are actually moving back in with the kids. And this is the, to help with the child care issue in many cases, but uh, and due to loss of loved ones and other extenuating circumstances. But we see there's an increase in multi-generational families. Uh, and then leisure and recreation, uh, there's an increase in wanting to travel, Volunteerism is supposedly on the rise. I'm waiting on them to show up and knock on the door. We're looking for them. Um, and increased interest in productive uh, activities. So when I uh, looked into the, the industry to see what kind of articles and what kind of information was out there, I found that there were six uh, themes, common themes. So there's an interest in balanced recreation. Now, balanced recreation is just basically, there's five components to balanced recreation. And uh, they, they include like physical, social, emotional, physiological, mental and cognitive activities, and spiritual activities. So that is considered balanced programming. Uh, now, these articles provide like best practices and, and information found within recreation and leisure. Uh, productive recreation, people want to have recognizable results in their recreation and leisure time. They don't want to just, uh, there's been an increase uh, and people wanting them to notice rec recognizable results, meaning uh, fitness classes. They want to want to tell that they're making progress. So our programming needs to shift to um, uh, appease this this new interest or this need. Park equity is something uh, that industry standards have said we, we need. We're looking to address the, the issue with uh, equ equitable parks throughout communities. Uh, NRPA has a great article, several articles out, uh, uh, that the national trend or the standard is setting is that it should be a park located at least 10 minutes, within a 10 minute walk of each uh, area. Everybody in your community should be able to make it to a park within 10 minutes, uh, a 10 minute walk. Um, and then outdoor recreation, of course, has been an uptick in the interest uh, in, in the field of leisure uh, where focusing more on outdoor recreation, self-guided uh, activities and challenges that you can, uh, you can uh, partake in. And then customer, customer service. There's been a lot of focus on how do we get the word out, how do we make it more uh, convenient to our end users. So what does that mean for leisure services? Uh, taking all those uh, common themes, we're reducing down to three, uh, I guess, ten of the values in our strategic approach. And like I said before, they're, they're more detailed than the original impact assessment, but intentional programming, service delivery, and park access are three areas that we want to focus on. Um, intentional programming, because we do have these multi-generational families now, it's important to provide activities for those adults that are taking lunch break and they want to uh, participate in a Zoom class. And have or in, in, in using hybrid and virtual programs so they can log off, come to your local park, and participate in some form of activity. So it's important to include morning and midday uh, activities uh, to our approach. Seniors, if we're going to have multi generational uh, families and households, uh, those seniors and those uh, boomerang boomers, as they call them are going to need activities and something to do. So uh, mid morning and midday uh, seem to be the ideal time frame for that. And then youth, uh, we need to, as, as the leisure services department, we need to increase our morning and midday programming for our youth that are staying home with their mother or father, who, whomever is working from home. And as I mentioned before, outdoor recreation, uh, getting self-guided. Uh, we talked about mobile or pop-up recreation pop-up parks, pop-up pop -up activities. Uh, service delivery, I think we're doing a good job. We do need to enhance our capability as far as um, uh, the ability to have virtual and hybrid programs, streaming, and having uh, the option to come in person. Uh, park access, just um, continue to promote our existing parks. I think that pocket parks is, is, is I guess the value of pocket parks has increased after this study. Uh, I think that the, as, as the city as a whole, we're doing a um, good job as, at already identifying that as one of our goals to increase our number of parks. And um, with, when it comes to top and ADA 
compliance and, and, and opportunities. We just continue to increase those options in our parks currently. And I think that's something that I'll love if you have any questions or questions about leisure services.
It's not a day goes by the Perry Police Department doesn't answer both the calls of that mental health. It's at least three to that I've heard of. Uh, and some of those are long drawn out, some of those are people that are depressed, uh, they're seeking medical attention, uh, they are dealing with depression, they are dealing with uh, schizophrenia. It is a, it's an ever increasing call to serve for us. In 2020, our family disputes went up about 6%. Actually, it's a little less than what we thought it was going to be, but we're actually back down a little bit 21 and 8 percent down. We do believe that people can ever get out of their house up compared to 2020 where you were locked in for such a significant time. Uh, and uh, we also saw an increase in, in 2020, 22% of neighboring disputes. Um, all this together, sometimes people don't get along well again. Uh, and some little things become big things. Things that would never really normally have complained about or had an issue with the neighbor about, whether it's music or a dog or whatever the case may be, that, that, that went up. And it's continued to increase in 2021, but not at the same pace, but at about 5%. We've, uh, we've seen an increase in calls for service in 2020. We've called it consistent calls at about 6.5%, but we've kind of leveled back out again in 2021. Uh, but total call for service in 2019 was, uh, over 2019 and 2020 was 5.5%, and we've seen about a 5% increase in 2020. Um, we still know the busiest days of the week, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, and we're going to be at night time between 9 and midnight. Uh, that has not changed. I started this business in 1987. Uh, our crime rate in 2021 in the city of Perry uh, lowered for the fifth straight year. Uh, that's going to be unusual uh, compared around the, the state of the nation. Uh, we have seen increases in aggravated assault with one more than we had the prior year. Nine more burglars and 13 more automobile uh, theft. But we've also seen decreases in murder, rape, robbery, death, and arson. Good thing that everything's not bad about people being at home and there are issues. Uh, we knew the call would increase for mental health and family disputes and neighbor disputes, and they continue to do so. Uh, and the burglars are, uh, although in 1921 were up, uh, we do believe that based on the population increase, the number of growth of burglaries uh, is probably less because of the people are at home. That's just an assumption. Uh, we uh, we believe that uh, people are going to continue to have uh, issues for being at home, but we also believe that, uh, as we mentioned earlier, uh, there's some pros to this this being at home. Uh, yes, it's going to create some type of issues at different times. It's going to create some issues between neighbors that we didn't used to have. But we also believe there's going to be uh, an improvement for us in some areas. Can you, and we'll talk about ways to provide better services to the citizens. Anyone have any questions? Questions?
Ms. Fisner's discussion about waste management, going to a simple call center. So if we have customers that don't call Public Works, and they get the first question they are asked, what city are you in, that's going to be real you know, put off for them. So there's these issues that we're going to have to be aware of and, and uh, work on educating and, and advising our folks, but also adjusting our systems where we can. Uh, following up on your point, we'll have more of the indirect presentations for you when on economic development and, and some of the other areas. Other questions? Thank you. Item 3C2 is a GDA approved draft from the RFP for the Ball Main Street lot. Mr. Smith. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, Mayor Council, this is the first of a couple of items that will be coming to you this evening uh, following up on the regularly scheduled downtown development authority meeting that was held last Tuesday. Uh, what you have before you in your board pack for this particular item is a draft request for proposals. Uh, this is a request for, for proposals for the redevelopment of the uh, public parking lot at Ball Street, Main Street. Uh, this has been reviewed and approved by the Downtown Development Authority. You all recall, I believe, back in October, November time frame, uh, there was a request from the Downtown Development Authority to you all to do something with that lot. It was the opinion of the Downtown Development Authority that that particular lot as a public uh, service parking lot is not the best use of the property. And given the limited uh, a footprint of the downtown development district, uh, doing something there with a bit more density would be favorable and preferable for the downtown area and driving foot traffic and providing to the commercial mix, all that type of thing. Uh, there were some projects that have come and gone at that site. And currently, what the downtown development authority would like to pursue obviously is this request for proposals. Uh, they would like for your concurrence to put this out and receive proposals from qualified uh, developers to work with them to locate something at that site that you all as mayor and council and that the downtown development authority would deem favorable for the downtown development district. You can see in the, the request, uh, in the introduction portion of things, Generally, what the Downtown Development Authority would like to see is some sort of mixed-use development uh, of some sort of density. We're thinking three stories. And incorporating uses uh, ranging from residential to retail, restaurant, professional office space. Uh, I think ideally the Downtown Development Authority would like to see some residential uh, and some ground-level commercial, uh, however that might come to be. Moving along. The project criteria, uh, obviously the Downtown Development Authority would not want to pursue anything at that site with a developer that is not qualified to perform this type of work and that does not have uh, the requisite experience and wherewithal to do something like this. So you can see that they've crafted some criteria uh, that would provide some, uh, provide a frame of reference to the Downtown Development Downtown Development Authority and you all, uh, but also some detailed information about how the Downtown Development Authority could work with this developer to see something come to fruition at that site. So the site plan, the renderings, cost estimates, all that type of thing. Uh, then, of course, a uh, review of the financials of the proposed the offer, if you will, uh, toward the Downtown Development Authority, making sure that they had the uh, financial wherewithal to complete something like this. Uh, if we were to move forward with this, in receiving the proposals, uh, you can see how they'd be uh, evaluated out and weighted with uh, specific types of criteria, project concept, demonstrated experience of similar projects, uh, development team experience as the people that are actually going to be here working with the downtown development authority to locate something there, project methodology, financial standing, and yes, that does not add up to 100% as a typo, uh, but we'll get to correct it prior to going out. Uh, and then getting proposals, getting into the Downtown Development Authority, the Downtown Development Authority members reviewing the proposals and determining based on this criteria um, and possibly interviews, uh, making a decision about a developer they'd like to move forward with that they think is going to provide a very beneficial project on that site in our Downtown Development District. Uh, 
continuing, it's, it's really just, you know, Mr. Worthington and his team's partnership stuff. Uh, but basically the requirements associated with submitting a qualified proposal to the Downtown Development Authority in the specified time frame. So that's what the Downtown, Devel Downtown Development Authority would like to do. Uh, staff and the, the board members are in concurrence that this would be a very uh, beneficial thing for us to do. If nothing comes of it, nothing comes of it. Uh, we, however, think that given the location, given the uh, momentum that we have in the downtown development district right now, that it would be a very uh, enticing uh, possibility for qualified developers to work with us on this. Moving forward, uh, we would again like the concurrence. And as we have discussed in the past, uh, the transition of the ownership of the lot on which to do this uh, would require your all uh, your approval you know so getting a qualified project bringing it back to you all you all saying yes this is something that we would like to see in our downtown and then allowing for the formal transition of the property for the downtown development authority to begin work with the developer questions council yes sir Purchase a lot. 
lot from them. We build this. We think you'll like it. It kind of coincides with some of your criteria. Great. Uh, they go the route of the, the long-term lease. Uh, where you know, the city or the downtown development really maintains ownership of the lot or maintains ownership of the building and the lot. You know, there's, there's a whole bunch of different ways it could possibly be structured. Um, so leaving it up to the developer to put together something that they would be, they would see as, as beneficial, uh, I think would be as beneficial to the downtown development board, if that makes sense. Uh, or you just, you also added in there the potential of owning the building. So that's included in this, that's part of this particular RFP that the city could own the land and own the building. That's, a, po that's a possibility. It's, it's open to that sort of proposal should they choose to submit something along those lines, yes. I, I think the other important factor with this too, is to remind the council members, is the DDA does not want to progress with a certain particular project and then have it not go forward because council does not approve it. You know, when you talked about the uh, property that you're referring to, Ms. Peterson, the DDA purchased that and already owned it. So they had every right to do whatever they wanted to do. And in this particular case, they elected <laughs> to put it up for sale. However, the parcel that we're talking about with this proposal is owned by the city. They already came with one proposal on how to develop that, and council was not comfortable with that proposal. So I think out of an abundance of caution and to provide as many different options as possible that will satisfy council for the transfer of the title of the property, that's why they are pursuing the RFP proposal. So they'll go through, as Robert indicated, they'll have the reviews. Uh, based on whatever comes in. And then if they feel that a particular project is beneficial, they will come to you. And you will have to give an okay on that project relative to are you agreeable for what's being proposed to transfer that title of the property over to you. Because you may remember that was one of the conditions that you gave with this parcel before, is that council had to come with what the use was that's going to go in. We may not get it. You know, I don't think that, that'll be the case, but, um, you know, if, if this doesn't work or we receive proposals that the DDA does not deem as, as beneficial or what they want to see downtown, uh, you know, they'll consider other options. <coughs> I think in, in reading this through, I didn't necessarily see that as So it, it could really run the whole spectrum 
Um, but that's what they wanted to see, is, is what, what is the market, what's palatable for the market right now? You know, what, what do developers want to do in our downtown? Um, that answers your question. breakdown criteria, what would be considered a, a valuable percentage? What they added some some for this and some for that and some for that. If it adds up to a total of 50%, is that enough to go forward? Does it need to be 75 or above? Does it need to be 100%? What would the DBA consider viable? Well, uh, the, these are weighted percentages. Mm -hmm. um, so basically, you would take each proposal and you would evaluate them based on the criteria that's put together for each of these different uh, categories. Uh -huh. And then you'd go in and you'd say, well, this is, they, they did pretty good with the project concept, but their, their experience is not there. So they'd be graded high on project concept, which is 30% of the overall evaluation rating. And then they'd be uh, you know, low on demonstrated experience, which is 15%. And they are here to evaluate all, all the things independently. Each DDA board member evaluate all the things independently. Based on this criteria, um, to come to a weighted evaluation score for each proposal, which then can be stacked up against the other proposals. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay. I, I, I think my question was just if, just to say you have one proposal, um, what percentage stack up? To, I mean, what would be the percentage that you feel safe about? There's no stated threshold <coughs> on that. Um, it, you know, you look at it independently. Uh, if it's if it's a project that comes in that's marginal, you know, there's no, you'd say, well, that's not what we want to see. And you don't have to do anything with it. Um, if it's a project that you think would be beneficial and it scores okay or whatever, then okay, well, this, this could work. Um, you know, let's get back with mayor and council and see if this is something we can possibly move forward with um, as far as negotiations go or whatever it might be. There's no, you know, it has to be graded out to a certain level in order for it to be considered a viable project. Well, where it says, <coughs> just up above us, percentages, number two says stated ability to uh, demonstrate it to execute similar projects, so would that eliminate any startup people? If it was a developer that has never done anything like this before, they would score very low on demonstrated experience with similar projects. Would that be enough to keep them from being considered viable? I, I would know. You know it, if everything else is great and the other proposals come in, they're not so great, but they have some experience. <coughs> it also depends on the, the type of situation we see with the proposals that we receive. It would not preclude them if they don't have any sort of yeah. such experience, but it would, I think they can fairly do the goal. And I, to add to that, I would guess the reason for that is that while you might score low in one category, you might score outstanding in all the others. And that could be a potential tipping point for a more favorable decision in a certain case or not a favorable decision in another case. Um, so it's my understanding, correct, Robert, there's not really a absolute, you know, thing. But I think for me, I see that as a good thing because it gives us and the DDA more flexibility and more even specificity in terms of what they select and why they select it. That's the way I see it. I see the railroad parking lot, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, 
I see the, the railroad parking lot as overflow parking for things like uh, Food Truck Fridays, festivals, uh, New Year's Eve. I don't see it as a place to park if I'm going to run in concert designs. Uh, nobody's going to park that far. So as far as access for shopping, which I think is different from parking for big major downtown city events, um, that is a valuable spot to lose. I don't know that our strategic plan addresses that need for closer end parking for regular everyday shopping traffic, uh, shopping parking. Uh, we're doing good with overflow now with the new one, but it's, I, I know that was just a brilliant to, to put that in there, but I think we need to be convinced that at this point in the history of downtown Fury, the highest and best use is not parking. Well, you, if I may, you'll have a more updated answer on that when the parking study is done this fall. Right, we authorized that, or actually, I mean, the study's going to be done sooner than the fall. It's going to be done in the uh, like beginning of summer, I think. But like you're asking for it tonight. You're Pardon? asking for the consensus tonight. That was my point. And even even with the studies we've had, and even if we had a new study, we know we know that the general population opinion is, and the one that we hear constantly is, we don't have to be great part, and that's people speaking out from their frustrating experiences, regardless of what our studies might show us. So I, I'm a little on the fence as to whether or not that's not the highest, best use for it right now. Certainly it's not income producing opportunity, but um, it might be needed by the citizens of Perry right now. I, I would suggest if that, if that is a concern of council, then they need to say so. And we'll tell the development authority, don't proceed with that site. You know, we have, we have come in with other parking studies that indicates there are a number of parking spaces available. There's not the perfect parking space for every single person who wants to shop on Kirk. But in a reasonable walking distance for all the business locations downtown, there currently is satisfactory to more than satisfactory parking downtown. If the direction of council is they want to hold that parcel as parking and not transition it into some other higher, better use, that is certainly your policy decision, and then this process right here stops. I think the What's very important, you know, coming from the DEA and coming from staff is for council to take a look at and make some determination about where you want the downtown to go. If you feel it's important to keep the downtown like it is right now, or was five years ago, you know, depending on which constituent is talking to you all, obviously, then let us know, and that's, that's what we'll wind up doing. But the DEA feels, and the staff feels, which I concur with, is that we have an opportunity to capitalize on this growth and the interest that we're having in downtown and that most of the people coming to downtown are willing to walk a little further or park a little further away from their particular location to go through and experience what our downtown is. You know, our downtown is not a slow pace, country type place where I can come in any time of the day, park right in front of a store, go in, get whatever merchandise I am going to get, and then come out and leave. You know, we're moving away from that. So 
and, and depending on who you talk to, there's already that issue because I can't find a parking space on Carroll Street at some particular time right in front of a meeting, I think it's one of the businesses down there, okay? But I want to point out to council members, even though you hear that issue coming up sometimes, it has not translated into any drop off in the lack of interest in our downtown or people willing to come in, park a little further away, and go to the shops or whatever the case may be. And so, you know, maybe remember we've talked about doing some realigning on the parking on Main Street. You know, we've talked about some other uh, changes on parking on uh, Carroll. Uh, but we are not, we're not now, we haven't been in a number of years, and I don't think we'll ever be in a position to guarantee you'll have that parking space right in front of that store uh, anytime that you are able to, you know, come in the downtown. But I think it's also important to, to take a look at what our downtown is transitioning to. You notice the, the recent construction and everything that we've had has been uh, on the former DDA property is um, multi-use, Airbnb, and I think retailer possibly a restaurant downstairs. The, uh, Former Rusty's location where Orleans on Carroll is going is transferred from various type of things, but office space and a restaurant to a much larger upscale type of restaurant with, uh, I believe, residential apartment living up above it. Uh, we, we ourselves are transitioning downtown from the underused old courthouse to our municipal court and your functions and all those type of things. These are all evolving, you know, type of uses and everything that uh, you know focus on more of a interest and a flexibility and a curiosity, if you will, for people coming into downtown, like I say, to experience it, rather than to just come in, buy a pair of shoes, and go. And I think that that is the the vision that DBA has relative to where they think it'd be a good idea to go, and that's why they are proposing this RFP. Uh, as Roberts indicated, the DBA may not find any of the proposals acceptable from their, from their standpoint. They may determine that, that some of the proposals are beneficial, but they are lacking, kind of going back on Mr. Jones' point. Great idea, but not able to demonstrate that you're able to deliver, you know, the idea. Whatever comes in that DEA is interested in, then it comes back to you all. And at that particular time, going directly to your point, Ms. Peterson, you may say collectively as a council, that's nice, but this proposal does not outweigh the need for parking. See, when you we'll always have that option there because you are the owners of the property. But if we were to, you know, one of the considerations obviously would be if a proposal comes in that is multi-use really seems to make sense and can add a lot more money onto our tax digest compared to a parking lot that's not full all that much of the time. Uh, from my perspective as a manager, that would be a good trade-off. And I think that's something that we should do and encourage. But all, whatever winds up coming on this, it's still going to be whatever you all collectively are comfortable with. How many parking spaces are in that line? 25. 25 at the most, if you got I, I have not seen many people parking on Main Street or up on Main Street behind the Methodist Church which in most cases is closer than that parking lot. And we got more than 25 parking spaces on Main. Our parking's not being utilized as the comfort, and the vast majority of people who work part in that parking lot are employees. My frustration with the city right now is that we have more employees of stores parking on Carroll Street, parking on Ball Street, utilizing or taking up those parking spaces that 
customers could use. And that's, that's where the big complaint comes from. I mean, when you have five or six employees working and they all want to park on Carroll Street, you can't do it. They're going to have to park away and walk in and leave the parking available. It's just consistent. I mean, I think that it's better for us to try to maximize the value of that and then keep, move people a little further out. Uh, because no one parks on what I would characterize as, I guess it's the western side of Main Street or whatever direction that is. Um, uh, I guess it's closer to south, south side of Main Street. Um, it's never utilized, unless you're going to Snuggles Bank. But that's only a block away from, you know, and you can actually park there and be closer than many places in town. So. Well, yes, I think um, but on this end, to me, I was the owner of a business downtown. I'd rather park further away and walk to the bending and let people come in shopping in my building, walk right there in front of the bending so they can get what they need and move on. Because if I'm going to take a lot of space myself, then people come by. I would come in the store, but I ain't got to really walk. I just keep driving. And so that's some, they done lost some business right there, you know what I mean? And so like I said, staying outside of the block. Like you said, this is one of the things that as we consider and, and I like to see people continue to grow. You know what I mean? I said, I think it will continue to grow because people are flooding into the city of Erie. And that it's like you said, uh, Mr. Kimmel, I think it's up to this council member, we're going to have to decide on which way we want to go. You know what I mean? Like that, the PDA is making a decision, and like you said, they can't make a decision. Uh, they can make a decision, but then they got to bring it back to us, and then we go. And you made a statement. I think the thing they need to think about if they're going to put something on the property, or we're going to allow them to put something on the property. They got to think, they got to think outside the box. Are they going to be able to afford to have it go? Are they going to have to come to us like they did in the past? That we got to put funds out to get them to do what they need to do. And so I think that the industry, if we want DDA to be able to stand on their own feet to do what they do, I, mean, I think it'd be better, like you were saying earlier, the revenue coming. I think that would be better. That's one of the things that we have to look at. We want to be able to keep revenue to keep things going in our community. Because that's what we want to do. So we want to grow to a point. We don't want the city of Erie to, to die down because of lack of history. The longer we keep that revenue going like we're going, people are going to come because they like what we're doing. Well, on Rock Pad, I want to say to Lee, I don't believe that the future of downtown is dependent on that corner lot. It's, I mean, I don't think whatever we decide, whether we build a three story uh, condo unit or we leave it for parking. The future of downtown Perry is not dependent on that corner. But uh, Robert, I I am supportive of the DA uh, PDA having a project. I think I want to feel more secure of, about it in the sense that in October we just we just had to have a roar. I mean, we just had to have it. Well, now now we don't need that anymore. Now we need a multi-story, multi-use building. So. We don't, we don't. In three, four months, what might we? Well, the only thing in October was the brewery came to us, and that was the opportunity that was presented. This could have a brewery in it. But we they, thought that was going to be the best and highest use then. And now it's a multi-story building. I just want to feel like we have our feet on the ground and we know. We know what we want. But you're going to have the opportunity to make that decision when you see the proposal. You you might see the proposal and say, no, I don't, I don't think that's you know the best use. I mean, the council's going to have. But if we don't allow them to present anything to us, we'll never have anything. And that's, I think that's what they're asking. And this is a, a mechanism to give you some choices as you move forward. So. Well, it looks like to me everything they, they present
one foot forward, we come up with 10 reasons why they need to go back further. And I just think we need to, it's, it's just like city council. If, if, if every time we try to put something forward, we are shut down, then that would give us the opinion that we are not doing what we need to do for our citizens. So I'm just concerned that if I was them, I would feel like every time we try to come up with something that might be workable, that you all put a stumbling block in the way. One day, somebody has to make a decision that we either need to go forward and we don't need BDA if we keep stopping I read, I listened to what they said tonight, and I think there were some positive things that were said. There might be a couple of things that might be looked at, but I don't see any reason to not go forward with it. I mean, everything they tried, we, put, we stopped. That was October, it's just like, every two or three months I might change the color of my hair. But that does not make it wrong. It just makes it different. So I think we need to look at that as well. Mr. Governor, do we, do we need to put this on the agenda for a vote tomorrow night? If that would have the council more comfortable, that'd be fine. You also could have, since it's not something directly for you at this stage, you can just have a consensus. You know that DEA can go ahead and proceed with their process because they're the legal entity that's doing that. And then they will, and then they'll come back. You know, to you all. It's whichever way you're most comfortable with. Or you can, or you can say no. You know, not that site, or not this uh, RFP, you know, whatever it is that the majority of the council is comfortable with. What is the council's pleasure? Okay. You know, you want to vote tomorrow, or are you comfortable enough to let the DDA move forward and see what they bring back to us and give them the opportunity? I'd like to see it go forward with them with the consensus and then they bring it back to me. That's my opinion. That's my opinion. Consensus. I'm fine with the RFP document. All right. You've got consensus. Majority council. I mean, you've got majority council. It says all of it. Unanimous council says your consensus is going forward. All right, 3C3 is the BDA approved draft of an incentive policy, Mr. Smith. This is kind of following up on the previous discussion. Uh, one of those things that's been hanging out there for a little while now that um, the Downtown Development Authority really needs some, some guidance on. So we had a conversation, uh, I believe it was in January, February time frame, following up on uh, the project that uh, Ms. Peterson mentioned that was brought to you all this past fall. Um, and some uncertainties and concerns surrounding uh, some of the parameters associated with that project, most notably the uh, public financing portion of things. Uh, so the Downtown Development Authority thought it would be prudent to go ahead and formalize a uh, general policy uh, that outlines the incentives that may or may not be available to projects downtown and give some criteria about when certain incentives might be available uh, and the thresholds associated with uh, set incentives. And some of them, uh, as you see in the, the document before this evening, uh, really don't concern the downtown loan authority a whole lot, but I think it was good to consolidate uh, all the general items in something that could be provided to business prospects in the district. Uh, going through it, uh, you can see incentives generally. Again, offer on a case-by-case -case basis, uh, should you all choose to move forward. Uh, nothing is ever guaranteed. I think that's a, a very important part of that. Uh, generally, if the Downtown Development Authority was looking to incentivize a project downtown, it would need to meet some or all of the criteria that are kind of outlined there, right? So a project that creates or retains existing jobs, uh, promotes private investment in the district, leverages state and federal dollars, I mean, kind of see you know, the, the general projects that the Downtown Development Authority might look to um, incentivize at some level. Um, getting into the meat 
of the policy that you have before you, uh, the types of incentives that may be offered, again, on a case-by-case -case basis, uh, the downtown development authority, a uh, revolving loan fund that's been utilized in the past, uh, the facade grant program, a very popular program that is utilized uh, often downtown, the natural gas, gas incentive program that you all established has been very successful that uh, reimburses costs of natural gas appliances up to 50%. Uh, that's the purchase of the appliance and installation. Uh, the very, uh, a very good thing for restaurants downtown in the district. Uh, downtown development, historic preservation partnerships. These are the big state programs that typically see uh, incorporated into, into downtown development projects. The DDRLF, Georgia Cities Foundation, and then of course state and federal historic preservation tax credits, which can be quite lucrative and rural zone tax credits was the city, and uh, Ms. Hart has done an excellent job on uh, making pay, as you say, with that program. Unfortunately, it uh, expires at the end of the year. Uh, and then, financing assistance, and this is what um, was the area of concern that, uh, that was brought to you all with the, the brewery project, the brew pub project. And based on the input that the Downtown Development Authority and staff received from you all in that discussion and subsequent discussions, we think we put together a workable option to possibly provide uh, assistance, you know, through revenue bond issuance or traditional bank lending, um, again, backed by the city. And this kind of goes back to the discussion we had about the DDA is not credit worthy, that type of thing. When it may uh, be uh, prudent to provide. And you can see getting into that, uh, eligible projects must provide 20% of total project cost. Uh, the owner equity is 20% uh, must be real or personal property, so no operational expenses, that type of thing. And then it goes through, kind of like you saw in the uh, previous document, a uh, number of criteria that would have to be met, uh, or information that had to be provided in the downtown development authority considering coming to you all to back financing assistance. Financial plan, um, existing businesses showing um, financial statements, source of capital, so do they have the money they say they have, uh, history, ownership, legal structure of the business, and experience of the team, and then uh, the type of financial assistance that must be sought. And then in regard to what type of project would downtown development authority be interested in incentivizing in that way or, or some of the other ways, uh, some of the criteria here. And you all recall that initially when this was floated out there, this document, the incentive policy, there were some things in there in regard to job creation. And there was a lot of discussion after that. Uh, it kind of goes back to what we're talking about with some sort of residential structure downtown. The Downtown Development Authority would like to be able to, um, should it present itself, uh, incentivize downtown residential development. And that does not always come with employee creation. You know, it doesn't create jobs, it doesn't necessarily retain jobs, that type of thing. A lot of times contracts to a management company, that type of thing. Uh, but still, that would be a very good thing for downtown, is creating some of that, that livable 24-hour, uh, you know, as they say, uh, occupants downtown. Generally, you can see the type of incentives that we went over, uh, the Downtown Development Authority Revolving Loan Fund. In order to be considered for that, they would need to uh, provide a direct investment in the district of $100,000. As far as the natural gas incentive program, uh, purchase natural gas appliances, of course, state and federal downtown development programs, those are program dependent, uh, those criteria set by the state, you're either eligible or not. And then financing assistance, you can see here, the $775,000, essentially what this is saying, if a project comes to the Downtown Development Authority that is going to invest $775,000 or greater in the Downtown Development District, um, that they would consider some level, if, if they needed some level of financing assistance, again, through the revenue bonds or the traditional bank financing, that type of thing. That number was, when you think about the type of projects that are uh, significant enough downtown, uh, and you look recently, right, you have the uh, Orleans and Carroll, you have Oliver Perry's, you have Main Street Bar, you have uh, the Motor Corporate of 
innovation that the Taylor Group is, is uh, pursuing, and you have the Commodore building and the Muse Theater. You take those six recent projects, you average the investment of those projects altogether, it's $775,000. So we think that's representative of the type of level of investment we'd like to see downtown and possibly incentivize. Does that make sense, that, that criteria we came up with that? To, 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 to $775,000, that could be not just their own money they put in, but it could be, it would include all their other loans and yes, funding. Of the, the project itself, the project itself. investing $775,000. So you can see uh, they would need to, 20% of that, if they were to be incentivized, would need to be under I And mean, that's that skin of the game. Um, that a number of you had some issues with about that project that was brought to you this past fall. Hopefully addressing some of that concern. That's kind of what the state level is, is it not? For many of the programs, they have to have 20% equity. State is actually 10%. I'm sorry? It's 10% state. Okay. So, you know, above and beyond what the state actually requires. And then getting into the process of actually requesting incentives. And, you know, community development, Ms. Hart, um, Ms. Hartley, you know, everyone's really good about uh, being, uh, make, making themselves available to prospects downtown. So if they're, if, if they're approached by someone about doing something downtown, hey, you know, sometimes we can incentivize these programs to our downtown development authority. Here's a process you go through, there's an application, all that type of thing. The downtown development authority will receive the application, evaluate it, uh, determine based on the threshold criteria and the request. Uh, what they can or cannot do as far as incentives go. If it's beyond the financial wherewithal of the downtown development authority coming to you all, um, should they wish to offer a project some sort of financial incentive. But it gives the downtown development authority uh, something to work with, you know, some sort of um, sense of uh, they can go out and speak to this and, and let prospects know this is generally available to them should they want to come down. Questions? Oh, could you explain the hundred thousand dollars DBA revolving loan again? That do they have? Would anything be loaned under a hundred thousand dollars, or is that not what that means? Uh, this is essentially saying if the project were to come in, kind of a seven seventy five figure, if they were to come in with a hundred thousand dollar investment. Oh. The downtown development authority could consider that for some sort of revolving loan fund assistance. They would have had that much to okay. Correct. Okay. Any additional questions on this? Other questions? Are you looking for a consensus to move forward with this as a guiding standard for? things they can do in the future and then from that they'll come to this body and make any decisions. If, if it's if it's part of the financing stuff where you yeah. all would have to back in, yes we would come back to you all. For the rest of us we have very little to do about this. Only additional financing that we would have a concern about. So. Council? Are you okay with it?
understanding what they want out of the community so that when they leave for college and go do something else, they choose to come back to Perry and invest in the community and, um, you know, again, making it a place of choice. And also helping you all, uh, guiding you all in regard to some of the build out, some of the strategic plan stuff, comprehensive plan stuff, just providing input from a group that has not been represented very well at this point in time. And also uh, providing back to them some sort of level of education because if you look at uh, if all the classes and stuff, I, I know when I was coming up, there was no local government class in schools. We just didn't have it. Uh, it was touched on, but most of the focus was on the federal level and all that type of thing. So a lot of people don't understand what local government actually does. So again, providing a tie-in to that group to educate them and hopefully educate others, you know, kind of a domino effect about how local government impacts their lives. And what a cool place it is, and the city's awesome, and it's a great place to work, you know, all that type of thing. Just generally providing for a favorable concept of what their local government is and does for them. Kind of, kind of rambling now, I know, but what the youth advisory council would look like. Uh, you know, seven member board, you have two members from each of the high schools that represent the city of Perry population. So that'd be Perry High, Veterans High, and Westfield. And then you have an at-large member. And they would be required to apply. Uh, staff would review the applications, get to you all for your approval. Um, a, a, basically a slate of members each year. And you can see what the criteria for uh, these members would be. It, very you know, general, you know, you hope to kind of cast a wide net on this type of thing. An interest in learning about local government, uh, be able to commit to serving at least one full term, and then have kind of the same type of attendance requirements as all the other advisory boards, and then be in good academic standing and free of any serious disciplinary infractions in their respective school. So you put it out there, you know, pump it up, you know, get applications in, evaluate them, choose your folks that have uh, some sort of indoctrination period, you know, some sort of retreat possibly. And then throughout the year, they would meet on a regular basis. Staff would have for them topics that they could meet on. You know, oh, the city's working on renewing their plan first, you know, initiative or something like that. Here's what we're looking at doing. What do you all think about this? You know, and kind of going through things. We're working on our strategic plan. We're working on, uh, we want to know what types of events you want to see. Uh, here's what we're doing with the money that we collect from your parents, you know, all this type of stuff. Uh, it could be very good uh, in that sense to where it provides them something that, again, is, is currently not being offered to the youth in the city of Perry. Questions, comments? What, uh, what grade level of applicants is, is there a set 10th grade? generally open to 9 through 12, uh, but I think we'd envision it initially as being juniors and seniors. And we could stipulate that as, as part of the criteria if it didn't be beneficial. I think, I think junior and senior stipulation is a good one, Robert, just in my experience. Uh, but I just want to add that I really am excited about this. I agree with Robert that this is a, a forum to give uh, the youth a direct say in the right voice in, in their community. Uh, and I, uh, that's something that we strategically plan for is obviously the future uh, of our city that we all love, and they are the future. And so I think this is, I think this is great, and I appreciate all the work that we do to it. Other questions? Hearing none, are you okay? Moving <coughs> forward to you. This will be coming back to you all for a formal meeting <coughs> since this is the resolution. Okay. That would be great. We'll do that tomorrow. Okay. Item four, <coughs> council member rights. Dr. Albright? No, sir. Mayor for council member. Mr. Hunt? Mr. Peterson? Yes. Mr. Jones? Okay. Mr. Gilmore, anything else for us? No, sir. Mr. Smith, anything else? No, sir. Ms. Newby, anything for us tonight? Ms. Warren, anything from the city clerk's office? Thank you.